Imagine a future in which deaths on the road are so uncommon they make headline news instead of a footnote in the local newspaper. Where roads in our cities are no longer congested and time which used to be spent sitting in traffic can instead be put to more useful use. Where the air is clean and the simple act of moving people and goods around doesn't have to come with the high price of pollution where people who might not be able to drive themselves can move around as freely as those who can, and where the financial burden of personal transport is heavily reduced. Well, these are some of the benefits that we believe automated transport can unlock. And so this is the future that we imagine in our quest to develop self-driving shared services for Europe's cities. But before we can put even just one vehicle on the roads, we need to be sure that that vehicle knows the rules of the roads that it must follow and to demonstrate that it can do so. And this concept of governing rules for robots it has been around for a long time and Asimov's three laws are probably the most well-known example. But like Asimov's laws, most of these discussions focus on very high-level rules or principles. And when it comes to particularly uh, complex day-to-day -day activities, such as driving in a busy city environment, high-level rules by themselves are unlikely to be sufficient to deal with the complexity of the environment and to ensure that we have a safe system that can uh, accommodate the benefits of all of the different road users. So imagine if you were to drive from here back to your house. If you had a single principle that stated, uh, for instance, that you shouldn't cause harm to any pedestrians or cyclists or animals along the way, that would give you plenty of flexibility. It would tell you the what, but it wouldn't tell you anything about the how. Um, so you would have the freedom of choice, for instance, about things like what speeds to adopt, uh, when and how to signal your intentions to other road users, and perhaps even things like which sides of the road to use. But in normal driving circumstances, that, that freedom of choice would be liable to create chaos on the roads. So as drivers, uh, to, to avoid that, we learn a much more detailed set of rules um, that introduce ideas about things like rights of way, about moderating our speeds for different driving conditions, about stopping for pedestrians, obeying traffic signals, and many other specific details. And so it follows that if we want to design robots, machines, uh, that can also undertake the driving task in broadly similar environments, then those robots will also, as a minimum, need to learn and follow the same set of rules as human drivers so that they can operate safely alongside humans. And for driving, that set of rules is expressed as the Highway Code. And this is the first edition of the Highway Code. This was published in 1931, and it ran to 18 pages. Uh, and this is the modern edition of the Highway Code, which you'll be familiar with. Um, this has been updated and expanded, and it now runs to over 100 pages. But crucially for us, uh, as our focus is on developing safe self-driving vehicles, the Highway Pro Code approaches safety in the context of humans behind the wheel, and not robots. Uh, and we see this if we look at things like stopping distances, which are calculated by taking a thinking distance and a braking distance and adding the two together. And for this particular example, the thinking distance that is used is based on our understanding of a human's ability to perceive and recognize and react to the environment around them. But this context of humans behind the wheel is, is very important because our automated vehicles don't possess human equivalent intelligence. So although an automated driving system is a very complex system and it's very computationally advanced. It's not an example of a general artificial intelligence that can, that can think about and reason about its environment in the same way that the human brain can. Uh, so while on the one hand some of its capacities, for example its capacity for perception, might outperform that of a typical human, so the vehicle might be able to, to see further than a human or to see in low light conditions or poor weather conditions, on the other hand, its capacity for, for cognitive reasoning is much more primitive than a human. And so if that's the case, what happens when we want to take a set of human-facing laws uh, that have been written for a human system, what we might perhaps call analog law, and we need to ensure that our vehicles can also follow those rules? Well, 
it turns out that it's not actually so easy to program those rules, uh, to, to write them in code. And, and here are some examples. So what do we mean when we say, for instance, uh, to, to stay clear, clear of an area? What does it mean to reverse no further than necessary? How do we apply good judgment uh, to moderate our driving speed to adapt to the circumstances? And as human drivers, we have, a, we have an intuitive feel for these sorts of things, and we might even call it common sense, perhaps. And we're able to apply that common sense to an enormous breadth of different driving scenarios where these rules might be relevant. But it's not always so straightforward to, to take that human intuition and to turn it into something which machines uh, can learn and can apply to their behaviors. So our first challenge is to, is to find a way to turn this into, into human rules. And, and to be clear, this isn't about having a separate or a unique set of rules for automated vehicles, but it's about an elaboration and a clarification of the existing set of human-facing rules. And so when we think about that in the context of uh, the highway code, we have a, a non-trivial exercise on our hands. And so for a start, the highway code has over 300 separate rules in it. So if we were to take each one of those in turn and examine the, those rules and their intricacies and to figure out how to put them uh, into a language that a machine could understand, we would have a very time-consuming endeavor on our hands. And even more so if we had to repeat that exercise for every country in which we wanted to drive. So we have an immediate challenge of scale and then we might expect some debate and disagreement along the way, because for many of those rules, there isn't a, a single clear right or wrong answer about how to take a, a human law and to turn it into something machine facing. And if you think about, uh, if you think of, for, for instance, a translation between two different human languages, if I were to ask, three translators to take a passage uh, in Arabic and translate it into Mandarin, for instance, I might get three different responses back. Um, but all of those responses might be more or less correct approximations. So as well as the challenge of scale, we have the challenge of complexity. And then we have to consider that even now, nearly 100 years after the first edition of the Highway Code was published, the code is still regularly updated, and new rules are added and rules are amended all the time. So faced with this challenge, uh, if we want to make progress, we have to find some way to break the problem down to make it more manageable, and there are a number of approaches we can take. The first is to uh, come up with some sort of triage process to find some way to identify an order of priority for which rules to tackle first. And uh, there are various criteria we can use to do this. So we might decide, for instance, to first focus on uh, rules that cover common driving maneuvers, such as turning and overtaking. Uh, and once we tackle those, we might then decide to move on to rules that cover common driving conditions, such as driving in adverse weather. The second thing we can do is to get some real world experience under our belts, um, because this is useful because it might not always be immediately obvious which of those rules are actually the trickiest ones to translate until we start trying to put them into practice. So some controlled uh, real-world development activities can help us to pinpoint those trickiest translations that we need to spend uh, the, the most attention on. Uh, and the third thing we can do is to expand our vocabulary. So we can develop our language, uh, the, the language that we have available to us, to describe the full, uh, the full extent of possible driving environments that we might encounter. Uh, and here's an example. One of the recurring themes in the highway code is that drivers should adjust their behavior to suit the circumstances. So for instance, in wet weather conditions, drivers should anticipate the need for a greater stopping distance. Now, wet weather doesn't just mean that it's raining right now. And as human drivers, we understand that perfectly well. But if that's the case, then it's not sufficient for our automated vehicle only to display wet weather behaviors when the sensors detect that it's raining right now. Uh, so roads might still be wet even when it's finished raining, or perhaps even when it hasn't been raining in the first place, for instance, if there's been a burst water main. So we need to have a broad enough engineering vocabulary available to us so that we can describe each of these different conditions so that our vehicle can detect which of these conditions it's operating in and it can make the safest behaviors. And the fourth thing we can do is we can collaborate with others in the industry and with government and with regulators uh, 
so that we each understand how the other is thinking about the problem. And this can help reduce future conflict. So if you think of the problem of crossing a river, for instance, if we're building a plane to get from one bank to the other, then any sort of safety authority would want to be sure that they're not only focused on the safety of bridges and boats. So uh, through collaboration, we can uh, come up with, we can divide, have the best possible chance of devising an approach that works for everyone concerned. So some combination of all of these approaches can help us address that first challenge of turning human laws into laws for machines. But this is only part of the puzzle because when it comes to human-based systems, humans don't always uh, strictly and universally follow the law. Uh, and in some cases, uh, drivers might choose to disregard the rules purely for their own ends. So for instance, an impatient driver might decide to drive down the hard shoulder in an attempt to jump the queue. And in this example, the driver's behavior is very clearly not motivated by safety. But in other examples, a driver's behavior might indeed be motivated by some set of expectations relating to safety. So if you think about a, a busy and a narrow road, a driver might reason that it's better to uh, mount an empty pavement in order to let an oncoming ambulance pass than it is to stay on the road, if to do so would mean blocking help from getting to where it's needed. So if it is the case that a human driver might find some scenarios in which they think it is the safest or most desirable thing to do, not to follow the rules, but instead to, to be led by some other values, uh, led judgments or, or behavioral norms, then might it also be the case that the same is true for our, our automated vehicles? And so in other words, might there be some situations in which the safest thing for our automated vehicle to do is to act beyond the legal limits? And if that's the case, how on earth do we go about anticipating this infinite scenario, uh, infinite landscape of scenarios that our vehicles could encounter? Um, and how do we adjudicate between all of the different possible behaviors that the vehicle could display? Well, when we're faced with this infinite landscape of scenarios, we can't possibly illustrate and write rules for every one of them individually. So instead, we return to one of the themes uh, with which I opened, the idea of higher level rules. And if you remember, one of the challenges of higher level rules without any additional structure was that they, they, uh, they're too chaotic for the majority of driving situations. But when it comes to driving scenarios where to, to, to follow the, the strict constraints of the detailed rules of the road might not promote the safest outcomes, then, then some of that freedom of choice that results from high level rules can give us more options about how we behave while still preserving the things that are important to us when it comes to the what. So for instance, uh, we might state that uh, however we choose to behave, there should never be more than some specified amount of risk of harming a pedestrian. And over time, as we accumulate more real world experience, we might even begin to, uh, begin to develop some, some more formalized rules about the behaviors we can adopt in some of these situations. But even if we can agree that some set of high level principles might be useful, we still need to agree what those principles should be. And the German Ministry of Transport uh, made an early attempt at doing this a couple of years ago. But in spite of this early attempt, um, these conversations are still relatively immature between the industry and, and government and society at large. And these discussions um, have a lot further to run. Returning to the road, there are many challenges that still remain. So today, when a regulator approves a vehicle as, as safe to use on public roads, much of their focus is on something we call functional safety. So if I turn the steering wheel in one direction, for instance, do the wheels move accordingly? And if the vehicle can meet the requirements, then it's functionally safe. But in the future, regulators will need to, to confirm that a vehicle knows the rules of the roads for all of the roads on which it might travel and that it can apply those rules. And the existing functional safety framework doesn't easily accommodate those sorts of questions. So new types of testing will need to be developed. Uh, and we share some of our thoughts about what those testing frameworks might look like in this white paper that we published recently.
Now, when it comes to automated driving, or when it comes to driving, sorry, the transition from humans behind the wheel to automated vehicles is not going to happen overnight. And in fact, it will unfold over many years. And in the meantime, we'll have this, uh, what we refer to as a mixed economy of human drivers on the road and automated vehicles. But eventually, um, just as we saw in the first part of the 20th century, when we saw the transition from horse and carriage to automobile, we'll see a transition from humans on the road to automated vehicles. And this raises some interesting questions, because uh, today I've talked about human laws for machines. Now, if we were to start with a blank sheet of paper and to design a set of rules, a set of laws, and a set of standards for a system which is comprised entirely of automated vehicles, it probably wouldn't make sense to hold those vehicles to the, to the same standards and to the same rules as human drivers. So we have this interesting and exciting possibility about a future where maybe the, the, the rules of the road are changed much more fundamentally to take account of the, the capabilities of automated vehicles. Um, but just as we might also think about more radical rules of the road for a world where we, for a world comprised of automated vehicles, we might also think about different uh, ways that we enforce the law in a world comprised entirely of automated vehicles. And if you think of some uh, examples of uh, common human offences in driving, for instance, driving above the speed limits, uh, when we record that offence, we record that offence at a specific instance in time. So it's sufficient for us to know that the driver broke the speed limit and a violation occurred. And we might apply some sort of penalty, uh, but we don't adjust that penalty based on uh, the distance that the driver travelled over the speed limit or the amount of time that they spent travelling over the speed limit. Um, and we don't, one of the reasons we don't do that is because we don't have enough complete information about the driver's cumulative behaviour. But when it comes to automated vehicles, we might begin to have that sort of information available. We might be able to extract data from those vehicles that does describe the cumulative extent of the behaviour, the, the effect of the, the extent of the violation. And so, as well as having potentially different rules for a system which is automated, we might also have different approaches to enforcing those rules. So, in summary, when we take, uh, when we take a set of human laws and we try to translate them for machines, uh, we can expect to encounter some practical difficulties. And some of those practical difficulties arise from this, this gap, this kind of uh, this intuition, this, this reasoning gap that exists between humans and machines. But even if we can find a way to translate those rules into something which machines can process and apply, uh, there are still many outstanding questions. Some of those questions relate to how we might uh, evaluate and approve these systems uh, to ensure that they behave in the way that we intend them to do. Some of those questions relate to the standards that automated systems should be held to, particularly if we can demonstrate that those automated technologies might exceed human performance across the metrics that are important to us. And some of them relate to uh, how we might enforce any new rules for automated systems. So, Automated driving is just uh, is, is an early example of taking human rules for the road, uh, human rules and applying them to machines. Um, but although it's an early example of this problem, it's certainly uh, not the first, uh, it's, it's certainly not the last. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>